there's a new law that has actually already been passed that I've got a bunch of notes here that I wanted to go over with you because it's going to affect every single person in the United States. Everybody, every law-abiding citizen in the country is about to be uh, shocked with some of the things that are coming our way based upon the infrastructure bill that was passed. Now, let me just give you some, um, let me give you some background on this. You say, what does this have to do with you as a criminal defense attorney at your law firm? Well, first of all, understand this. We all know that DWI, DUI, depending on how you call it in your state, it's a very serious offense that, of course, we know, you know, no one is for DWI. It's, it, it imposes a very significant threat to the public and it has cost people their lives. And so as a result of that, though, sometimes here's what happens. The government will overreach and they'll make decisions about things that cost people their liberty as a result of that. The 2021 Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act now requires all new cars built after 2026 to implement systems to passively monitor the driver's performance for the purpose of detecting drunk driving. Now, specifically, H.R. 3684, Section 24220, tells us here that what they plan to do is that, un I mean, the Congress has already passed this. They've already put it into place. The infrastructure law will now require connected vehicles to collect, think about this, collect and process data to detect impaired driving. It can monitor the driver's behavior and it can also affect steering. It can literally take over the control of the vehicle if the algorithm determines they think that you're doing something improper. So HR 3, uh, 3684, known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, includes these provisions related to drunk driving prevention. And these, this, these provisions that I'm going to talk to, to you about here today are going to be required new safety features in all cars, all vehicles, all trucks. And car manufacturers uh, are taking steps here to, I mean, they, they have no choice. They're taking steps to be in compliance with the new federal law. And there are some companies such as Volvo and Ford who are already using some of these technologies and plan on having in their, in their car next year in 2024. So if you plan on buying, buying a Volvo or a Ford, get ready. These Many of these technologies are going to be in there already. So now the problem is, everybody says, this sounds wonderful, right? It's a good thing. It'll keep people from drinking and driving. The problem is you have to understand the implementation and you have to kind of peek behind the curtain to see the effects of what takes place. Okay, let's take a look at this for a minute. So here's what it says. For connected vehicles to monitor drivers, there will be some form of technology that will require the collection of data while a driver is in the car's interior. The interior of the car, and here's the issue, this now collides with what the law says. Under uh, New York versus Class 475 U.S. 106, uh, a Supreme Court decision decided back in 1986, the court has said that the interior of a car is considered a place with a reasonable expectation of privacy, even under the fourth, as, as defined under the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution. So the problem is we also know people, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't exactly be, feel very comfortable knowing that some algorithm or some monitoring device can take over my car whenever it wants to, and I don't have any control over it. So the problem is, is when we look at this type of structure, one of the things we have to figure out is we understand that according to to this new bill that the interior of the car is going to be monitored. There's going to be a data collection of everything that the, the driver is doing as they drive the vehicle. And so one of the things that we see, for example, a video recording of the interior is going to be allowed to record certain things, racial or ethnic information. It will record the likeness of the driver and the passengers. And it will, if the vehicle can monitor the speed limit of the road, it can provide precise geolocation. It's also likely going to be able to monitor your speed. So it's going to be able to tell if you were speeding at any certain period of time. This is all the stuff that's talking about that's in the infrastructure bill that's required. Now, car companies and manufacturers are justifying this. They're saying, okay, look, we, first of all, they didn't pass the law. They just have to be in compliance with the law, but they're not against it either. Many of the car companies are great but with this because they, they said it'll help to be able to enforce traffic laws. But one could argue that the collecting of this sensitive information could, number one, it's unnecessary, right? Why are we having to collect all this information if we're just trying to prevent drunk driving? Um, but it invades your reasonable expectation of privacy by how you operate your car privately. So the collected data, here's where it gets really kind of 
This is where it gets kind of like, you know, crazy minority report movie type stuff. Here's where it gets a little crazy. The collected data could be misinterpreted by the algorithm. Suppose the vehicle monitors the driver's behavior to identify drunk driving and stops the vehicle vehicle after what it believes to recognize as drunk driving behavior, but then it determines later it wasn't drunk driving behavior. It was somebody with diabetes that ho had low blood sugar and it made them appear to be drunk. What about if it's someone that's tired or sleepy, or maybe it's a sudden medical condition? I mean, maybe the worst thing that could happen is to stop the vehicle and drop it in the middle of the road. Or and Yeah, there's lots of other questions we're going to ask about this too. So one answer to this is, and I'm going to tell you, here's the answer to one of the proposed things that was debated in Congress, was to um, use the infrastructure law would allow cars to be equipped with a breathalyzer and a video monitoring device to assure that the data collection is actually drunk driving. So now they they can collect the data and watch you all the time, actually watch you on video on video as part of it being built into the vehicle. This would reduce the chance of a driver's behavior being caused by something other than alcohol. So it maybe would help not unnecessarily stop a vehicle, but then it becomes even more complicated because now you're talking about a passive breathalyzer. What if it picks up the alcohol content of a passenger in the car and it doesn't pick it up of the driver? Now, I know a lot of this new technology, they're trying to create safe harbors. They're trying to create ways to eliminate these sort of things. But anytime you start introducing wholesale technology like this, making it mandatory on everybody, you're going to end up having a violation of people's rights. So just think about this. I'm going to go through this. Per the bill, the proposed safety device will, quote, passively monitor the performance of a driver of a motor vehicle to accurately identify whether that driver may be impaired. To, re to re uh, According to the Ride Act bill, it states to require the Secretary of Transportation acting through the, administer of the administration of the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration to prescribe a federal motor vehicle safety standard for advanced drunk and impaired driving prevention technology, and here's the catch one, and for other purposes. What does that mean? What is the other purposes? And of course, that's the problem. That's the catch-all language. That's the stuff that Congress throws in there to be able to collect data on everybody for any reason that they want to. And so anybody who wants to enjoy the liberty of operating a motor vehicle now will have to be forced into this framework where the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration is going to be able to use the equivalent of surveillance technology on everything you do in your vehicle. And, uh, you know, there's some questions that come up on this. In fact, one of the things that it says in the bill, this bill states this, technical capability, any advanced drunk and impaired driving prevention technology required for new passenger motor vehicles under subsection A, that measures blood alcohol concentration shall use the adult legal limit for blood alcohol concentration of the jurisdiction in which the passenger motor vehicle is located. Now, the question has to come up here. In order to determine that, that means it sounds like there's going to be mandatory breathalyzers required in every single vehicle. Does that mean there's going to be facial scanning uh, technology that's required? Something else here? What exactly are they going to require us to do in order to be in compliance with these things? And, and the reality of it is the bill includes something that's the equivalent of a kill switch. In other words, here's what the bill says. It says, because driving prevention surveillance technology for drunk, impaired, or other purposes, by the way, the way that it talks about this, it's passively, it must passively monitor. But the moment that it comes up, that it determines that there's a violation, that there's, it will, it will stop that impaired driving. So if there's a preventative measure that's associated with it. So think about this. This kill switch technology is running in the background. So whatever you're doing as you're driving down the road, if, it, if the algorithm determines it thinks you're doing something off base, right, then all of a sudden it's just a kill switch. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that if you deviate from your normal driving habits that the kill switch kicks in? Does that mean that uh, it's going to learn your specific idiosyncrasies of how you drive. And, you know, I've driven with people who do this all the time on their accelerator. I've driven with other people who weave within their lane like this. Cause I don't know why they just, they drive me crazy when they drive like that, but that's just how they drive. Right. Does that mean it violates something according to the, to the law? And so the problem is the kill switch system outlined by the ride act basically says that it, it, it was such a system to be able to distinguish impairment, uh, and, but the problem is it doesn't tell you how it's supposed to do it or how it's supposed to be set up. How does it distinguish between drowsiness? If it's designed to combat the pro the problem of impairment, does that mean it's going to literally seize up? Is it going to stop on the road? Is it going to immediately pull you over to the side of the road? How are all these things going to be determined? By the way, here's the other issue. The term impairment is very much open to interpretation. When I read this and I look at what it says, 
we simply looking for symptoms of drinking or are we trying to determine someone had a toke of a marijuana cigarette? Um, and how do we determine whether that person is impaired or not? Who has, and here's the real question, who has access to this data so that they can make use of the kill switch system? Will the police be given access to this data without a warrant? And this is where you start talking about losing your civil liberties. And this is where it, it, it comes in. And what I'm talking about with DWI cases and not just that, but your insurance companies. Are these people going to be able to get access to this stuff and use it against you in some way? Is it all going to be public source information for people to get access to it? And, and you know, if insurance companies can get access to this stuff, they can use it as a reason to increase your insurance premiums as a result of that. And so, you know, do they, are they now going to try to create ways to force you to change your driving habits? Understand the manipulative effects that this can have, and it opens it up. It's really to the wild west of other uh, other people being able to use these type of things against you. And so, the other question I have on this, when it talks about driving, uh, when it talks about driving prevention in the statute, if does that mean that it's actually going to be looking at the vehicle when it's sitting in park? Like, is that going to be active when you're just sitting on the side of the road? What if it's running but it's in park? Is it going to kill the car? Is it, is it going to, is it going to work all the time? Anytime you try to do anything in your vehicle, is that what it's going to do? The problem is this is all going to be installed in new vehicles. So there's not going to be any way around this. Any new vehicle that you buy is going to be required to do this. So it means big brother and his agencies are going to be constantly monitoring what you do, how you're driving. And if you're a threat to public safety and they get to make that determination, right? You may have never been in a car accident in your entire life, but they may still deem you to be a threat to public safety, okay? So you should, should you do something, um, it, it, what happens now? If that is that information is available, what ends up taking place? What if you end up violating that and you, the, <laughs> the algorithm triggers you? Does that mean you're sitting on the side of the highway? I can imagine I'm here in Dallas area. Imagine being pulled over on the side of the road because your kill switch kicks in. You're just sitting there. How long do you have to sit there? How long does the, are the police called? These are all issues that you have to consider in this situation. So, and by the way, what, you know, how protected are these structures? How are they open to someone that could hack into this? Is it open for other people to be able to get an open API to get access into this sort of information? So returning back to the legal interpretation here, here's one of the other issues that comes up that I ask about is what is, does the term impaired driving mean? What does that actually mean? Think about this. Currently, it, it isn't defined by any legislation. So does that open it up to whatever the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration means? Is that whatever NHTSA wants to say it is? And so as a result of that, can you imagine the extent of algorithms written because you choose to pass someone or go, or, you know, or get to the line? How do you be able to separate the line between your normal driving behavior and whether or not someone else is be able to turn, determine whether or not you're actually intoxicated? Now, listen, I'm trying to get to this. There is a risk of misinterpreting this data, and that's the biggest problem that we run into. It'll lead to false accusations of drunk driving. It 100% will happen because none of this tech is going to be dead on and these algorithms have to learn. It's not going to be foolproof. So I'm going to give you some examples. I talked to you earlier about Ford and Volvo. Uh, they've both been developing alcohol detection systems to prevent drunk driving that are going to be introduced on their vehicles starting in 2024. One of those is known as the driver alcohol detection system for safety. This system uses specifically breath and touch sensors to measure the driver's blood alcohol concentration. And if it exceeds the limit, the vehicle ignition system is prevented from starting at all. Okay. That's one way. All right. Now the one called the one being developed by Volvo is known as the alcohol lock. And here it uses sensors in the vehicle's gear shift, as well as the ignition button. When you push the ignition button to detect the driver's blood alcohol concentration through their skin. And if the BAC exceeds the legal limit, the vehicle again is disabled. The real question is not just that though, who's contacted? What else is that? Is that reported to someone else? In what way can that be used against someone? And so these technologies, I know they're aimed to prevent drunk driving. The problem is they're in their testing phase. No one knows what their margin of error is. They don't know whether, and none of these are foolproof. Even if you use the most reliable systems that are out there right now, the actual breath alcohol concentration that you use through a breath test um, used by the, like the Intoxilizer 5000 and others for DWI testing, those are not impenetrable either. They usually have at least some range of a margin of error, a variance built in. Even blood tests have some margin of error on them, okay? So it's, it's important to understand this. Now, Ford's system uses a touchpad on the steering wheel that detects alcohol uh, through the driver's scent, skin. Now, this, this is supposed to be used to be unobtrusive, and it's, it's supposed to be used to activate 
and it's supposed to dis, you know, ba basically deactivate the ability for the vehicle to start if it act, it uh, is able to determine alcohol. But once again, what is the margin of error? How is this stuff regulated? So the use of these decision making technologies, I know they're being used to prohibit drunk driving, but they create serious ethical questions, legal ethical questions. Now, here's where I want to get to and finish the last part of this. Think about this. Once people get access to this data, it can be used to manipulate you and punish you or reward you. And this is where I want to get into this term known as social credit uh, score type systems. Now, these type of systems, if connected vehicles can collect drivers specific behavioral data for purposes for impairment under the infrastructure law, it opens it up that rules and regulations may now penalize drivers for certain behavior that they don't like and use a score. They may keep score. Now, this social credit score, it's almost like a social scoring system where the government says, oh, you did good, you good little puppy, or you did bad, go sit in the corner. It's literally the way it works. And you say, oh, this would never happen in the United States. Well, let me tell you, this is similarly to how it was introduced in China. So when you look back on it, China did the very exact same thing. It first rolled out this system in China back in 2014 and has um, essentially would put people, I mean, China has now taken this to the extreme. Extreme. They have now rated individual in, China's, in China to put them on a blacklist or a whitelist depending upon your individual score. So if you are very bad, you're on a blacklist and there's certain things you can't do. If you do really well, you're on the whitelist. You can do all these other things. It's literally social engineering. It's social manipulation. And so the social credit score system is built on two parts. Here's how it works. Number one, data collection that, and then reward and punishment based on that data collection. So essentially data collection is performed in a multitude of different monitoring systems that could be used exactly the way it is right here in what I'm talking to you about in the infrastructure bill. Now, I, you know, most of those ways that they evaluate this are kept secret. Certainly they are when you talk about this in China, but they gather all kinds of everything from credit information to purchasing information to criminal background, compliance with court or administrative orders, traffic violations, online behavior. This is what China is doing. But it started by introducing it in a very small way, and it grew from there because the state got access to all this information. So this system, let me tell you what China did. China is to the point now the authorities have used social credit scores to ban individuals from doing this. Think about this. To ban people from purchasing flights, making reservations on high-speed express trains, from staying at luxury hotels, and for these – and here's another one. If they think you're using too many – playing too many video games, China will literally come in and actually slow down your internet speed because they think you're a chronic gamer. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. That's how in their life they are. So the punishment can also take more extreme measures. China has also done things that based of, if you take a, st a stance separate from what the state takes on this, you'll be denied entrance into a university. You'll be denied employment. But if you do what you're supposed to do, what if you have a high social score? What if your social credit score is high? Well, now they give you perks. They'll give you discounts on your energy bills. They'll give you a hotel without a deposit. They'll allow you to boost your profile on a Chinese social dating site. I mean, literally dating sites. And that's how much you're talking about the social engineering that takes place. Now, I know that's an extreme example, but I want you to understand the same concepts that were used in China to allow this social credit scoring system to be introduced is now being used in this infrastructure bill by introducing these mandatory reporting requirements for whether it's going to be a breath test device, whether it's touch-based devices. And look, these type of things already exist in technology. There's something called a scram device that people will put it around their ankle and they can actually determine whether or not they've been using alcohol or not. They are now introducing these devices into every vehicle that's going to be bought starting in 2026. So why do I say this? Look, I think it's important that people understand this. I have no idea how this is going to roll out from state to state. I have no idea how it's going to affect individual DWI cases, your, I don't know how it's going to affect your insurance rates. And, but I can tell you this, it will absolutely invade your privacy. And I can tell you this, there will always be collateral damage when something like this rolls out. And it's never a good thing when you lose just a little bit more of your liberties in the name of protecting you. I'm always suspicious when the state tells me they want to protect me. They're not my mommy and they're not my daddy. I don't need them to protect me. That's what we have as individual liberties and rights in the United States. So be careful about this new bill. Be aware of it if you go out and buy a new car. 